like for you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. tell you again I believe in preaching and uh, this past week uh, Teresa and Lauren and I uh, went to a music conference out in Houston and uh, on the way we stopped in at the Pentecostals of Alexandria and uh, had a great crowd there on Wednesday night and Brother Anthony Mangan preached and it was amazing I told Teresa as far as I was concerned, everybody could have got up and left and just let the three of us sit there and he was preaching directly to us. Uh, there, was, there were hundreds there, but I'm telling you that the word of the Lord was for us. And then on Thursday night, Brother Rob McKee, same thing. And then Friday night, uh, Brother Sam Emery uh, preached. And um, just the messages strengthening and encouraging and I don't believe any I, I, or I do believe every time we come to church the word of the Lord can speak something to our hearts if we're open and aware and I will tell you this if you go into it with a mindset of believing that that word is for me it's not for somebody across the aisle it's not for somebody behind me or in front of me that makes all the difference in the world. Because if you believe that that word is for you, it's going to impact your life. And I'd like to read to you just a couple of verses here tonight from Luke chapter 23. I'd like for you to notice in verse 33, the Bible says there, and when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And I'm just going to read on beyond just a little bit. And the people stood there, and the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. But I would really like to point your attention to verse 34 where the Lord says, or the word says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I want to preach to you on this thought about the Lord's dying prayer. The Lord's dying prayer. Let's ask the Lord to touch our hearts here tonight. Lord, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful, Lord, that the gospel writers, Lord, put this account, Lord, into your word. I ask you tonight that it minister to every heart. Let it speak clearly. And God, not only let us find conviction in it, I pray, Lord, that we find hope as well. God, speak into our lives, Lord, with authority, with power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord's dying prayer. This account that, that I have read to you here tonight picks up one of the sayings of the Lord. In fact, whenever you look at the times that the Lord spoke while he was on the cross, you find that there are 
seven times that the Lord said things while he was there on the cross. I know that generally speaking, a lot of times our minds can be drawn in to the crucifixion account, especially before Easter, as our minds start moving toward that great moment whenever the Lord was resurrected from the dead, but leading up to the resurrection, we a lot of times, or at least I hope that that you do, is that you spend some time in in your private devotions giving consideration to the path that the Lord walked while he was on his way to that cross. If there was anybody that had a perfect life, the Lord Jesus Christ lived out that one perfect life. In fact, there is a, a poem that uh, has been read a, a host of times. Some have even perhaps committed it to memory to be able to quote it called One Solitary Life. And it talks about the fact about where that the Lord came from and what that he accomplished in our lives through uh, his work. And if there was anyone that that ever had a perfect life, it was the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the same token, if there was anyone that ever had the the opportunity or reason not to forgive, the Lord Jesus Christ was that particular person. When you look at his life, you discover some things, some of those things, in fact, a lot of those things that we know of the Lord come from the words of the Bible that I pray that, that you have a love for. But there is never an account of the Lord where that he wronged a person. You never find him being involved in an unloving or an unkind act. There's just not anywhere that you can find that in the Gospels. You, you never find where that there is an impure thought, nor uh, do you find that there is ever a moment where that he yielded to any kind of evil temptation. There was a purity about the life of the Lord. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 that he committed no sin and then uh, there was no deception in his life, no guile that was there in the life of the Lord Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says that he was tempted in all points and yet he was without sin. Hebrews 7 and 26, the Bible tells us that he was holy, that he was innocent, that he was separated from, from sinners. And, and even those that, that somehow that they ruled over his case, none of those people could really lay a hand on the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, whenever you look in Luke chapter 23 and verse Four. Here is what the Bible has to say there that came out of the mouth of Pilate. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. There, there was not a single grievance that they could lay on the life of that man. Pete Pilate regularly said that, that there was a point where that he could not put his hand on any kind of dirtiness or any kind of, of filth that you would find in the life of the Lord. But whenever you start looking and realizing that there was a conspiracy of political leaders and that there was uh, by that same token the twisted religious men that were there in that part of the town that day and then the religious mob that began uh, to cry out to the Lord. They demanded all of his debt to be brought to them and there was an in injustice or an injustice rather that you could say about that. I would like for you to back up in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15 and notice what, what Mark writes about the Lord there in that moment or that point there of crucifixion. Look with me to Mark chapter 15 and I would like to point out in verse 8. Mark chapter 15 and verse 8. The Bible says, And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he ever done unto them. 
But Pilate answered them, saying, Will you that will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that they should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, he released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Again, you see that there was a crowd that they began to cry out for the Lord and say that they wanted him to be crucified. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 gives us some semblance of how the Lord approached that crucifixion there on that day because Isaiah the royal prophet comes out and says that he was like a lamb that was being led to the slaughter there the Lord submitted to the indignity and the injustice of that and he he surrendered to them without ever even any kind of protest that would come out of his mouth there was no resistance there were no threats or there was no promise of retaliation that would come from the Lord the Lord knew what his purpose in this life was and so what was it that caused him to be able to live in that particular way. Well, I would point to you here tonight that one of the incredible things that we find in the nature of God is His ability to forgive. And His ability to wash away and to cleanse our sins and wash us from the filthiness of our own flesh and from the darkness that this world would bring in to every one of our lives. That is the strength of what I preach to you here tonight. It's not a religious program. It's not some kind of of mind-altering part that I would be able to say that if you join up with this, there's going to be a self-help part where you're going to be able to help yourself. No, there is none of that. Here is what I tell you tonight, that there is forgiveness of sin and that is what every one of us need here in our lives. Forgiveness filled the heart of the Lord and there was a part of his life that he said there is nothing inside of me that desires revenge or anything to take place. There is a part where that we sometimes shrink back from that kind of behavior to be able to forgive because whenever you forgive, that means that there is some part of you that that is expressing or showing some kind of weakness or some kind of compromise. And, And I would tell you tonight that it's easier for us to shout on a Sunday night it's easy for us to want to give in to a song and I I realize my age is catching up with me and I'm trying to stay modern and so my daughter has graciously at times made playlists for me and I, I get at times I'm riding around town and and uh, I've got my earbuds in and you see that little Honda Accord bouncing around it's Lauren's playlist that's got me hopping at that moment and, and there is a part that you listen to that and it I mean it's kind of peppy it kind of makes you want to pat your feet it makes you want to roll down the window and get the person next to you to roll down their window and say hey let me sing to you a little bit here because there, there's a part that, that you can feel good when those praise and worship songs but I'm going to tell you it's easy to do that it's hard for you to forgive it's hard at times to be able to say that I'm going to release myself from the feelings that I have and from the retaliation that wants to take place on the inside of my heart 
in my spirit and, and we can at times we can enjoy the worship that we find here even in this church to lift us up above our burdens and lift us up and yet the Lord wants to do a deeper work at times in every one of our hearts he wants to get down to the inside and say listen to me there are areas of the heart and the spirit that I'm trying to get to and I'm trying to shape and I'm trying to work with and I'm trying to help and yet there is such a resistance at times that goes on in a private world to say Lord I'll let you everywhere else but you can't get in to that area it's easier for me to have private grudges it's easy for me to have secret bitterness that is in deep down in my heart but hear me tonight that as you live out your life and it is you track along in this life that those things will end up manifesting themselves as you go further in your life. That's why we have to look to the example of the Lord and say, Lord, I have got to follow in your steps. It doesn't matter how difficult or how challenging that I find it. You've got to let your spirit and your word live in my life in such a way that I am shaped and as Paul told the church in Galatia, he said, I want you to be conformed in the image of the Son. That's the hard part about living for the Lord. And we can sometimes surely say that, that the Lord, uh, he, he doesn't expect me to do that uh, particular thing, but, but that assumption would be wrong. I want you to turn again. I know we've got the screens here, but I want you to turn and look at this in your own Bible. I'd like for you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And I would like for you to get this thought. You don't have these words underlined in your Bible or highlighted. These are probably good verses because these again are some of the things that, that Peter writes. Now think with me for a moment what Peter was writing about, writing to. He was writing to a church that was a persecuted church. It was a, a church that was under pressure. There were people that were being killed. There were people that their lives were being and literally disrupted by the Roman government there in that particular day. And yet here is what Peter says in 1 Peter. Look with me to verse 21. He says it like this. Let's back up to verse 20. He said, For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults that you take it patiently? He said, But if when you do well and you suffer for it, then you take it patiently as well. That is acceptable unto God. But look in verse 21. He said, For even here unto you were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leave us an example that ye should follow in his steps who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth guile is deception there was no deception there was no trickery that was found in his mouth who when he was reviled he reviled not again and when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously whenever you give a thought to that that what Peter said he said look he said you're called to walk in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ because here is what I would have you to understand is this is that there's coming a day that there will be a righteous judge that will judge judge righteously and he will settle everything out the way that it needs to be settled out the challenge that we find sometimes in living our lives is we want justice here and we want justice now and the Lord he may or may not supply that you cannot let that rattle your faith everything that comes against you every offense every challenge every hurt hurtful thing that may come against you in your life there has to be a part of you that says that I have confidence that there's coming a day that the Lord will settle everything out and he will take care of it and so I remind you here tonight Brother Patterson mentioned it here this morning about a persecuted church 
There's a category of offense that can come to the church, and that's this, that is persecution. And we heard about that in our global mission service on uh, Sunday night or Wednesday night there at, at General Conference. And, and uh, there, there are people that are around the world that they are not sitting in nice air-conditioned buildings. They, they are not in a place where that they come to church and then when church is over they go out and they may enjoy some fellowship in some restaurant or, or somebody's home and, and where everything is protected there's places in the world and, and uh, brother Adam Hunley told about some of those people there that, that they, their bodies are crushed and they have to endure such persecution and as he was telling some of those stories I set up in, in those risers there and I have to tell you I, there was tears that, that I asked myself I felt compassion for what they were going through but I asked myself am I in an American church that perhaps has gotten so soft that if persecution was to come to this church how would we react to it would there be stalwart saints that would continue to serve the Lord it's easy to serve the Lord when there's no persecution it's easy to serve the Lord when there is no offense but what will you do when they're crucified and you what will you do Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 5 and I want you to back up there these are familiar words to you but look with me to Matthew chapter 5 and I would like for you to notice in verse 10 what the Lord says at one of his inaugural uh, messages there that he gave to uh, that church in, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10 here's what the Bible says blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. There is a persecuted church that is in this world and we have to understand that that persecuted church is having to endure some of the same indignities that Jesus had to endure while he was in, on the cross. That ought to somehow bolster every one of us to be encouraged here while we're in this church at this particular time. While we may enjoy the religious freedom that we have there ought to be a work about us that says we've got to do the work of the master while it is still day because night is coming night's coming night's coming when no man can work and yet the Lord he said those words to his disciples before he ever went to the cross now you consider here with me tonight and ask yourself the question, how well do you stand up to the slights at school? How well do you stand up to the insults at work? Is there something about you that stands up to that? Or is there almost a chameleon-like nature that you have to try to want to blend in with the world? And Jesus was saying that there's a blessing that comes to us at times whenever we realize that we are not in the, the happy crowd, I guess, that we're not among those that are accepted. And so the Bible tells us that, that one of the most powerful factors that we see in the four Gospels is the silence of the Lord before his accusers. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 63, the Bible tells us that he was silent before the chief and the high priest. In Matthew 27 and 12, he's silent before Pilate whenever he's in during the accusations of the chief priest. And then in Mark chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, he's silent before Pilate's questioning him. And then in John chapter 19 and verse 9, he has continued to be pressed by, by Pilate, and he remains silent. And then when you look in Luke chapter 23 and verse 9, he is silent before Herod. Peter would write in his epistle, 1 Peter, 
Peter 2 and 23 that there was something about it that he entrusted his life into somebody because he knew that the judgment would come at a moment whenever life would be settled out. And so it is we come to Luke 23 verses 33 and 34 where the Bible tells us that finally the Lord does speak. And the words that comes from his mouth seven times while he's on the cross. Up until that point, he doesn't say a whole lot. But when he finally is in those moments of agony, when he is nailed to that cross, it's then that the words begin to come forth. And the Lord, he does not speak of revenge. There there isn't any self-defense that you find that is there on the lips of the Lord. What's there? Forgiveness is at his lips. You remember what Jesus said? He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so it was not something that the Lord was just saying, I'm going to say this until I believe this. He, he was speaking out of the abundance of his heart whenever he begins to feel the pain that those nails go through his hands and through his feet. At the height of his agony, whenever his flesh is being torn, whenever his head, the crown of his scalp, is being torn by those crown of thorns and there's blood and sweat that's dripping down into his eyes but he can't wipe it away because his hands is nailed to the cross. If he slings his head to the side it's just going to embed that crown of thorns deeper into the scalp. You would think that there would be words that would come from the Lord. Now remember, this is the Lord that that gave men authority over demons. He gave them authority over diseases and sickness. He, He gave them authority over death. And you would think that a man of authority in that moment, he would speak in such a way that everything wrong would be immediately righted. But I want to tell you tonight that there's a greater authority sometimes than what force brings. There's an authority that responds, and it responds to forgiveness way more well than what it does to force and that's what the Lord did he cried out he said Lord Father forgive them they don't even know what they are doing their minds have been blinded by the God of this world they are at the height of deception and I Lord that there is a part that you have to understand that when our Lord was hanging on that cross he knew that those men that were in Involved in his murder, that were involved in his killing, he knew that they were at a place where that they were totally deceived. Total, absolute deception. Say, how in the world do you know that? Because of his prayer. Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And I have to tell you that more times than one, that there will be times in your life that after you have found yourself in a place of trying to pick yourself back up in prayers of repentance, that you'll be saying, Lord, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. The deception came. The temptation was there. And I found myself in a place where that I was flat on my back and Lord, I don't know and the Lord's, that's okay. Because the parable of the Good Samaritan is really a parable of the Lord who is going to wash up and clean up that man that the robbers fell on. And we find ourselves in that place more times than not. Most victims would have screamed out in fury and rage and injustice. But what the Lord, what's the, what's the Lord doing? He's praying. He's praying. Father, forgive them. For, forgive them. 
J.C. Ryle said it like this. These words were probably spoken while our Lord was being nailed to the cross. For as soon as the cross was reared up on its end and dropped into the hole, it's worthy of remark that as soon as the blood of the great sacrifice began to flow, that the great high priest began to intercede. You remember what the Bible says? We, we have a great high priest who's interceding in our behalf, who is praying in our behalf. And the longer that I serve the Lord, the more I've become aware of how weak I am and how strong that the Lord is. And salvation will be totally and fully completed at the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly there's a call to holiness. Certainly there's a call to prayer. Certainly there's a call to devotion. And the fact of the matter is this, is that we have an eternal, all-powerful God who saved us from this untoward generation. He didn't threaten. He didn't condemn. He didn't pronounce doom. He prayed. He prayed. He prayed. Serving as the sin bearer. Now you think about this for a moment. What is the sin bearer? It's every sin of the entire world. Corporately, at large, it is the sin of this world. But it's not just the corporate sin of this world. It's the individual sin. It's the sin that I committed. It's the sin that you have committed. It's a sin that the Lord looks at and instead of, of really just saying that you get what you deserve, that's not what He says. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He, he as a sin bearer, He takes our place. He surrenders His will. He gives His life. He provides it. He says, here's my life. I know it's not right. I know you can't even begin to grasp or understand how somebody is going to stand in your stead. Paul said in Romans 5, he said, look, he said, maybe, peradventure, that's the way the King James says, peradventure, perhaps, maybe somebody would die for a good man. But I tell you, there's bad men. But what does he come through and say? He said that when we were yet without strength. How does it go? You remember? In due time, say it, Brother Adam, in due time, when I needed it in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's why we've got to have the Holy Ghost. That's why we have got to pour our hearts out in a place of repentance and say, Lord, you have got to help me. You've got to get the sin out of my life because there is that part where that, that when we were without strength that Christ died for the ungodly. Divine mercy has an element to it. And the element is this, is that the Lord says that whatever is sinned out in ignorance, I'm going to forgive that. And yet what is also sinned in a place of spiritual blindness, I'm going to take care of that as well. And so we ask ourselves, was that prayer effective? You better believe it was. Because the Bible tells us, if you turn back in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, that there was people that were surrounded all around him on that particular day. But there were particularly two that Luke brings out. Look with me. 
into verse 40. Verse 39, rather. The Bible says in one of the male factors, Luke 23, 39, and one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said, Jesus Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Think with me for a moment about whenever Peter was at that moment that the Lord began to ask questions of his disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the Bible tells us that Peter all of a sudden spoke up and said, You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And the Lord responds back to Peter and he says Peter he said flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you and there is that same replication of that that takes place here while that thief is on the cross he all of a sudden looks around and he says do you not fear God seeing that you're in this we're, we're here because we deserve we paid our we're paying for our crime this man has done nothing what brought that in it was immediately that the same thing that happened to Peter that flesh and blood didn't reveal that to Peter nor did flesh and blood reveal that to that thief and all of a sudden that thief is opening up his heart and his spirit and he's saying oh my God you've got to forgive me and remember me today and the Lord looks at him and he says okay part of that prayer is, is that I do I will a holy fear awakened his need of God. And there's times where I wish that holy fear would get a hold of this generation. And that a holy reverent fear would sweep through this generation and cause us to experience things that flesh and blood don't reveal to us. That, that a theological degree is not going to reveal to you, that a seminary degree is not going to reveal to you, that going to church is not going to reveal those things to you, but all of a sudden there is that holy fear that gets into your heart and into your spirit, and there is revelation that begins to come because of that experience that you have, church. That is what we need in this generation is for a holy fear to sweep through our hearts and through our minds and say, oh Lord, draw me nearer. Draw me nearer to the cross where thou hast died. And so was that prayer effective? It was effective with that, with that, that robber, that bad man, that thief. It was also effective in another place. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 27 and 51 that the veil was torn in two. It was ripped from top to bottom. That veil was just torn apart. And there's some symbolism there that even though that the ark <coughs> had been missing from that place is that now that there is access to that particular place, to that, that veil torn and ripped. And there's something about it that we have to understand in our desire. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 deals at length with that cleansing of sin and about that veil being rent. Or that the Lord says, now you, you don't need a priest. You don't need a sacrifice. All you need is to come boldly before the throne of grace. That torn veil, it was accomplished by God and it shows to us that, that forgiveness is not only complete, but forgiveness is permanent. Did you get that? 
that forgiveness is complete and forgiveness is permanent. And there's times when our flesh and certainly times that the devil tries to bring it up because the Bible tells us he is the accuser of the brethren. And he'll constantly bring that up. See there? See? See? Look? See that two years ago? See that five years ago? See that 35 years ago? See, see that 50 years ago? And he brings that up and tries constantly to bring that to our attention. And yet the Lord is saying, wait a minute, that, that veil has been torn. I do my best <clears throat> try not to let when I was a younger preacher I had to confess I, there was times where I would pay attention to the news and pay attention to a variety of current events that were going on and I'd try to create and build sermons around some of those current events and I guess for some reason I, I sort of got away from that if you're wondering where that this thought came into my mind, I have to tell you that I'm not sure where I have been, but until, I guess, Wednesday afternoon, I, I did not know who Amber Geiger was. And, um, and so I look on Fox News on my phone, while I'm waiting for Lauren and Teresa in a, out in a restaurant in uh, Alexandria. And I see this Fox News says that Amber Geiger is sentenced for 10 years. And um, I'm sure a lot of you know the story. She was a Dallas police officer. And a year ago, um, it was a horrible story. I mean, it was a heart gut wrenching story, and she accidentally went into an apartment instead of her fourth floor apartment. She went into a third floor apartment, and whenever she went in, it was somebody else's apartment. And um, it was a man by the name of Botham Jean, and she was talking on the phone and was distracted. And he got up off the couch, and whenever he did, she pulled her service revolver out, and she shot this man that was 28 years old, which is the age between Justin and Nathan. And, and I'm telling you, it was an emotional story. And so I started reading some of the things that was going on with the trial and some of the things that were going on, and... and uh, and there was part of me that, that said that some justice needs to be meted out in this situation. And yet I was torn on the other side because I thought that she was distracted and, and, and she made a mistake. And, and, and what do you do with that? But in the sentencing phase... They let both of them, Gene's brother, who was 17, 18 years old, they let him get up on the stand. And I watched that. In fact, I watched it several times. And I'm, I'm going to just tell you, there was, there was tears in my eyes when I watched what that young man had to say. Because he talked about forgiveness. And I hardly ever, in preaching, show video clips. Maybe done it once or twice in my entire ministry. But I'm going to show you this video clip. Because this is what forgiveness looks like. This is what Jesus said on that cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do.
just like my brother did, but I see I I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I don't know if this is possible, but can can I give her a hug, please? Please. Yes. Sister Regina, if you could come to the piano. Watch that several times. That lady was the one that shot that young man's brother. Been a lot of commentary, a lot of talk. How do you do that? How do you forgive? How do you let things go? The only way you can do that is for there to be a power and a strength that comes from another world. That's the kind of witness that will change the world. That's the kind of witness that will change your family. We may have programs. We may have youth conferences. We can do everything we can. But at the end of the day, the way we'll reach this world is to have an experience that sets you apart where every bit of the retaliation every bit of the revenge every bit of the grudges every bit of the unforgiveness it gets out of your soul I can pray for you Brother Patterson can pray for you the only way that true transformation takes place is for the Spirit of the Lord to totally transform your life. Open these altars up. I'd like for us to kneel tonight instead of standing in the altar like we normally do. I'd like for us to kneel ask you to talk to the Lord Lord change my heart change my life help me to be a disciple help me to forgive like you did